Hello, my name is uh, Julius Schwarzer. I'm a student from Germany and I'm here at Raza right now. I'm going to interview uh, David, Dr. David Martin today. Um, I wanted to ask him about the new technology that they have found here at Raza. I was really interested in all of this because of my father. He does some theoretical calculations for this new technology. Since I'm always talking with my dad about work and everything, and I'm really interested in his work because that's what I want to do one day myself, I just asked him and then he told me everything about this new technology, or at least a little bit. It really interested me and I wanted to learn more and more. So I thought, uh, why not go to the man himself, Dr. David Martin. I'm one of a few people, there might not be many, many people out there, young people who are interested in all of this. But there are some out there. I think it is important that these people show that they are interested in stuff like this because this kind of technology can change the world. It can make the world completely better. And uh, I think just leaving that to older people, um, as my father likes to say, old farts, <laughs> um, it is not one day they're going to be gone. And we are the next generation. So we have to keep on um, finding more technology to make this planet or make this whole world a better place. I hope you guys enjoy my interview with Dr. David Martin because I'm really excited and yes, let's get right into it. Thank you. Hello, Dr. David Martin. It's nice to be here. It's a lovely place um, and I'm very honored to be here. So thank you for inviting me here. Oh, it's great to have you here. So um, yeah, today we wanted to talk about Raza. <clears throat> so I've prepared for this talk and this little interview um, since quite a while now. And um, so one thing that I did to prepare was I went to the homepage mm -hmm. and I wanted to know more about Raza. Right. And so the first thing that popped up when I went to the website was a beautiful picture of the earth and the earth looked very healthy and I thought is this the goal here with your company is this what you do to make the earth more healthy what is yeah so the tagline that we've used Julius is rejuvenate the world and it's a very interesting term because historically what we've seen and this has been the case for a long time but let's just take for the last maybe 250 years, we have a view of the world that resources are free, that human effort is required to make something valuable, and that we build what I refer to as a linear consumption paradigm that starts with extraction, it goes through some form of improvement, we actually get utility out of a thing, and then we discard it. So it's this birth to death paradigm. And what that does is it leaves a process over a period of time where more of the earth gets consumed and then the end result is we dispose of the thing that we don't think we want or we don't need or whatever else. So, so the last 250 years particularly have been this focus on not kind of dancing with the ecosystem of the earth, but essentially seeing the earth as this free option to manipulate to utilize and then ultimately to discard. And that model is actually a very broken model because what happens is that the way we treat the earth becomes a metaphor for how we treat each other, how we treat everything else around us. And so not surprisingly, we've built over that same period of time a view that says that people can be disposable, right? We invented the term laborer rather than person. Well, what does that mean? We actually are bringing that same logic to how we treat people. So we're, we're bringing this logic that says, you know, you're born, you're basically useless for the first 13 to 14 years of your life. Then you start having utility. And then when you hit, what, 55, 60, 65, you're useless again. So we bookend a useless existence at the beginning and a useless existence at the end. And then we fill the middle bit with trying to make sure that we've extracted value from your time, your effort, your creativity, whatever else. But even that, we're consuming with the ultimate goal of discarding. So there's a question that's a metaphysical question is for something to be reconciled to its original state, do you have to go through the defilement phase? Do you have to make something defiled so that it can be actually brought back to its whole position? And the answer is no. 
that's a that's a social structure that we put on things, but that's not the way nature works. Nature goes through a process. A seed goes into the ground. The tree grows. The tree absorbs water, nutrients, sunlight, all the things. When the tree finally has achieved the sum of all of its existence as the vertical thing we call a tree, you know, a storm comes and it blows over. But at that point in time, it doesn't stop being a tree. It now t takes ex experience of the tree and through decomposition, through molds and fungi and decay and various other life forms, that tree now becomes this dissemination of the essence of tree. And that goes everywhere. And now the thing that was standing in the forest is now communicating with the forest and it's communicating with other life forms and it's doing all that business. And at any point in time, we could say, well, did it die? No. It went through a phase transformation. So the phase of it's what we're calling the treeness, which is the growth of the tree from the seed to the full tree, is just a phase. And nature doesn't care where the phase is because it's always in this rejuvenation cycle. And so when we have that picture of the earth, what we're saying is that Rasa as a company is actually taking advantage of that very same cycle. We're building technologies that are built on that cycle. We're using them to extract information or industrial value from that cycle. But then the whole cycle has to be seen in this complete sense where we're not creating or destroying a thing. We're getting utility out of a phase and then making sure that phase can be in a cycle. Okay. So, okay, that's very interesting. So basically to sum that up, your goal is to, uh, just like you said, um, not, not destroy, but make something reuse. And all these um, things that, um, how do you call them? Those fossil fuels that are, yeah. one, that are one day gone, find a different source that will never be gone, that will be well, reusable. Yeah, so let's talk about even the term fossil fuel, right? What is a fossil fuel? Well, the answer is that it is a life form that was a collection of the sum of radio radiation forms of energy, photons, electromechanical, and, and then ultimately isotopic energy. That went through a phase, and it went through a phase that over a period of time has turned what was the organic expression of the respiratory phase of that plant into now the post-decomposition phase, mm -hmm. right? So even then, we use the term fossil fuel, but that's actually not correct. It's not fossil. It is fuel, but it's fuel defined through a very particular lens. It's fuel, which is merely the stored energy that was the substance of a growth cycle at some point in time. And then that growth cycle was exposed to heat and pressure and, and isotopic decays and all kinds of other things. And that's how it became what it is right now. And if what we do is we take the Promethean impulse and say, let's just burn it. And we don't care how clean it is. We don't care what its, what its intrinsic value is. Then we're disrespecting that phase. Now, the good news is it doesn't matter because every piece of CO2 that gets released out of the combustion of a fossil fuel is going back into the cycle. It'll go back into trees and plants and, and the ground and into the oceans and everything else. And we'll have blue-green algae blooms. And, and the process will happen again. But if we actually are unconsidered about how we do that, then the quality of our experience of both getting the energy as well as using it so that it can be repurposed puts it into a very long arc cycle. Right? We need to have millions of years for the fossil fuel that we combust today to become another time a fossil fuel. But if we're smarter about how we treat the organic material that now we're going to call the hydrocarbon, if we're smart about how we treat it today, then we can shorten the phase duration of that cycle. The same hydrocarbon we use today, we might be able to repurpose merely right after we've emancipated the energy that we want to use. So we don't have to think of this in this very kind of long epoch view of a linear sense of time. We can actually say, no, we can compress that and have more of a circular economy rather than a linear consumption extinction economy. And we use the term fossil fuel because we are wired to think of this extinction model 
rather than a circular rejuvenation model. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. So um, basically the duration has to be shorter. How can we this, how can we achieve this? What yeah, is so, so if we think about what happens right now in the classic hydrocarbon industry, in, inside of the classic model, what we now have is a process where we take a sludgy material out of the ground, we put it through a very energy intensive refining, upgrading everything, other modifications. During that phase, what we're doing is we're actually breaking the molecules apart. We're actually trying to fractionate them so that we have different kinds of classes of those molecules so that we can do different things with each one of them. The whole way through that process, what we're doing is we're inefficiently adding energy to a system which itself already has all the energy it needs, which is, by the way, fundamentally illogical. If we know all of the energy is present in the molecule itself, why would we go through the process of trying to put more energy into a thing that already is the resident holder of the energy? That's an illogical premise. But if what we do is we say, no, we can actually treat that material coming out of the ground in a more respectful engagement, right? Because right now, pumping it out of the ground is just brute force. Take energy to do it. We take energy to move it. Then we take energy to refine it. We, we actually achieve this highly inefficient system. And we do it to produce an end product that we're going to throw away. But if we actually don't do that, so if we actually use the RASA technology and we use a polar selective agent and say, what if we tune specifically for the target that we want? Now we take that target, we now customize that target based on our selectivity so that the thing we want doesn't have to be refined. We actually get it in the form we want it. We use it in that form. We don't have to put more energy into it. We don't have to put more inefficiency into it. We don't have to go through this pressure and thermal process to transform it because we get the thing we want. So we choose what we want. We choose how do we use it. And ultimately what we're then able to do is actually think about how we could reuse, whether it's capturing the emission, whether it's capturing the, the molecular structure post-oxidation, whatever it winds up being, we can actually think about capturing that in a different way and then using it in a new way immediately. So rather than having it just fly away as an emission and then waiting for the life cycle to take it back into the tree to make it into glucose that does all the other things, <clears throat> We don't have to do that. We can actually use the byproduct as a new product. Okay. Well, it's, that sounds interesting. That sounds almost like it's out of this world. Is this really possible because the way you presented it is like... Yeah, well, so easy. think about the two perpetual motion experiences that exist on this planet. There are only two that we can actually say in a living system that we know are perpetual. One is how mitochondria oxidize glucose where we take a six carbon and we turn it into five carbon. We release the energy that we say is bound in some photonic interaction with certain wavelengths of light. But that system just harvests the ecosystem, right? We don't have to, we don't have to organize getting CO2 to the plant. It, it actually just gets it, right? Inside of our cells, we don't have to organize the mitochondria, right? The ATP, all of the breakdown of the various structures of the enzymes and all of the chemistry that actually catalyzes the oxidation process inside the cell is a perpetual motion machine, right? You don't have to eat more ATP. You don't have to eat more NADH. It ha actually is there and it goes through this process. And it's a process that on both ends, the creation and the consumption of the exact same energy do what? They actually refill the exact capacity they took out, right? So the CO2 I respire, allegedly, which is what I breathe out, goes to the tree, which needs that CO2 to bind to create a closed loop. And the only reason why we don't see it as a closed loop is because we distance ourselves from the tree. The question that we have to ask ourselves, are we plant food? And we could make the theoretical argument that resp respiration makes us plant food. We're the ones feeding the plants, not the plants feeding us. But then the plant does feed us, right? But the, the process is a perpetual motion machine. The only input that we debate on exactly what the nature of it is, is the entanglement of carbon, which facilitates this 
energy transi transition between the creation of the thing and the emancipation of the thing. But the photosynthesis that happens in the leaf and the mitochondrial respiration that happens in the Krebs cycle inside the cell is the same thing in mirror. But it is, in fact, a closed system where all the energy does not get created or destroyed. It merely is transacted inside of this loop. People don't think that way. But there's no reason why we couldn't do the same thing with combustion. Remember, the thermal load of a burning log in a fire is the sum of all the photonic absorption that all of that tree had throughout its whole life. We're just emancipated and in quick oxidation. But when we look at that fire, what we're looking at is many sun fragments that are the sum that were stored in the wood. We didn't give anything up. We didn't get anything, right? The tree didn't complain about being, you know, out in the sun, right? It was there. That's where it got its exposure. It harnessed all of that energy. It stored all that energy. Now we're emancipated when we do fire. But we don't think about the emissions cycle of that. We actually think of it as a linear process where we say, well, we burned the log. No, you didn't. You emancipated sunlight. And in the process, you created a series of metabolic substrates, which then go back into a system that is a closed system. Okay, that's interesting. So basically create this cycle yeah. and have an infinite amount of energy, basically. Exactly. And like, what kind of science even is this? Because it sounds out of this world. Yeah, so the science is, is interesting because, you know, one can argue that since certainly Aristotle, we have been conditioned to see this very anthropocentric view of, of the world where we actually tell ourselves that humans are the arbiter of the way things work. So we describe the world through our own lens. We, we build our measuring systems and we build all of the things that, that we think we use to understand the world through a very, very anthropocentric view of the world. But here comes the problem. If you go back to um, somebody like Gottfried Liebens, who's an interesting character, person who gave us the modern form of linear algebra, which is a very interesting paradox. Because if you go back and you look at why he even exists in mathematic history, he exists because he was commissioned by religious patrons to come up with a mathematical description of God. So when you think about the classic linear algebra formula, y equals mx plus b, right? The calculation of the slope of a line. Yeah, I know this one. When you think about it, it's actually a very paradoxical equation itself because we actually have inside of that equation a very interesting and a very negative outlook on humanity and a very negative outlook, ironically, on God. Because if we look at what y equals mx plus b is at an existential level, we're saying that we understand what x is. We understand what a variable is that we think we understand and control. We know something about its scale. We know something about its behavior. We know something about the parameters in which it lives. And then we can measure, according to our theory, we can measure the relative scale of our experience of x. That's what m is in the formula. But B is interesting because B, we measure with great pre precision in the model, right? You've never seen so many significant digits as the significant digits to characterize error, which is a very interesting problem, right? We precisely measure the thing we don't understand. Now, when you say it that way to a person who's mathematically trained, they, they'll defend it. They go, yes, but we have to do that to make the model work. And I sit there going, no, what you should be looking at is if you have to have four or five significant digits to measure the error of the thing you don't know, then what it really is is an indictment on the thing you thought you knew, right? The inadequacy of the model is always measured precisely, but that can't be true because that means that we measured the thing we thought we were measuring imprecisely. And then we apply those as a sum to get to a predicted y. Now, here comes the problem. The problem is that type of thinking 
for the last 250 years has defined everything we have done in society, in our thought process, in how we teach, how we learn, all of the things we do. We say, here are the knowns that we can control and manipulate. Here's the unknown we're going to call error. In Liebens's cosmology, that was basically the God effect. And then why is the capriciousness of the projected outcome? So we have the thing we think we know plus an unknown variable equals a predicted outcome. We bring, we bring that thought process to everything we do, and not surprisingly, when we actually start moving into the last 200 years of mathematics, what we see is everybody adopts without ever questioning the assumption. Why do eigenvalues change when we add factors? Nobody bothers to ask that question. We know they do, but we don't know why they do. The why is explained as what well, just happens. No, nothing just happens. It's the capriciousness of the error of our model. If we add another factor, the eigenvalues change again. Add another variable, they change again. Why do we never look at the ratio of the delta eigenvalue to the variable that we added? And why is it that when we do multivariate analysis, what we find is that the more variables we put in, the more apparently chaotic the weight changes of our eigenvalues in each one of those formula. It's a very interesting problem. Nobody asks the question, well, what's going on there? Why is it that I have a model with three variables that seems to explain everything? I had five, and it seems like nothing's explained. Then I had seven, and it seems like they are explained again. What's happening there? What's happening is we're indicting the inadequacy of our own perception. Because we think we understand the scale of x, we think we're precise in how we measure the scale of x, both of those assumptions never hold. But we've built everything about science, everything about math on those two assumptions. And nobody has bothered to ask that question. So the technology we've developed and then the mathematics behind the technology we've developed is actually answering that question, which is to say, if we have the ability to, in an experimental condition and an industrial condition, show that we can create fields in which the model discerns itself. So we're not imposing a model on a system. We're creating a system in which the model is self-emergent. Okay. Now what I have is rather than a causality model, which is ultimately where we got with linear algebra and everything else, rather than causality, now I'm getting into a very much more interesting and more complex question. And that question is, what happens if everything we think we know is entirely bound by the dimensionality of context? And if we change our context, in other words, just change our point of view, if we change our context, can we understand a thing that itself never changed except the field effect of our observation changed its experience and changed our experience hmm. so somebody just inventing this technique just came along and went beyond what other people had thought about and um but this is still interesting who came up with it and Why? How did he do that exactly? Well, so so Bill and I have been working together since Russia back in the in um, the '90s, and <clears throat> what what happened was, you know, my background, my my experience was in understanding um, systems at a very different level. So you know, I did a lot of work in some fairly interesting fundamental and theoretical mathematics, and so I approached the world largely through a data model view. I always thought that it was interesting that we pretended that language was meant to communicate. I always saw language as an encryption technology, not a communication technology, right? I choose a language. I grew up speaking German, so I could have this interview in German with you. But I'm choosing the English language because you're choosing the English language, which means there are people for whom this is going to be communication, and there are going to be people for whom This isn't going to be communication. And the difference is that we've chosen a cipher and we've chosen a, 
an encryption technology that we call language, and we say that that's going to be how we communicate. But what we're really doing is we're selectively identifying the population to whom this matters, and simultaneously we're excluding a population for whom it's not going to be accessible. Now, if you think about that, and you think about the mathematics behind the notion that language itself is its own cryptology. That's number one. Number two, realize that what we do in physics and chemistry is the heightened form of exactly what we just did. We pick capriciously a thing back in 1860s called the periodic table that's built on a general atomic theory. That atomic theory is built and predicated on what ultimately is expressed as the first three laws of thermodynamics. But what's the underlying assumption of all of those? The underlying assumption is we can understand states. But states are two-dimensional planar projections in the ever-unfolding end dimension of time. And this is the giant breakthrough with our invention. Bill approached this from a more classical chemistry approach. I approached it from more of a classical theoretical approach. And what we did was we actually met in the middle of that he was desulfurizing oil at the time with very little heat and pressure and was able to pull sulfur out of, out, out of oil. And that was a very big thing in Russia, very important thing to do. He was using polar selectivity to do that. I was actually doing a bunch of things with hyperpolarization of noble gases. I was doing that for all kinds of industrial and medical applications. So our worlds collided exactly at the right time. What he was working on, what I was working on, when we brought them together, showed that there was an inherent interaction of fields of energy that explicitly defied what we called thermodynamic models. And because I was more of the mathematician geek, and he was more of the physical chemistry geek, we kind of found a way to communicate with each other, which was very effective in starting to think about where else we could apply this technology. And so really for the last now 25 years, We've been working together on multiple applications of the technology, both for um, what we would call cohesive uses, which is how we bring things together that wouldn't normally get together, and for what I would call kind of the separation or polar selectivity applications that we have when we get things that both selectively attract and repel. So that's, that's its own other thing. And then the other principle that we actually work with is the fact that there is a unexplained phenomenon, which, which I refer to as the intrinsic memory effect, which is how we store information, energy. Um, you know, the term I've played around with is calling it the transitive effect. In other words, there is a adhesion that's happening. It's not ad or co or, you know, repulsion. It's, it, it, there is a piece of this, which is the unification of things. But the trans nature of it means that it can actually be inverted at variable intervals, which means it can store data or energy or anything else. So you have adhesion, you have separation, and you have transmutation of things inside of systems, which allow you to put oscillating frequencies into that, where you can actually go from you know polar shifts or you can go through electrical shifts or chemical shifts or anything else and store information or data inside the same system. Now, to do that, I did a lot of work at looking at signaling mechanisms at cellular membranes. And so my, my most notable stuff was looking at pulse electromagnetic field therapies and, and conditions on both medical and on physiologic applications. And then what you start to realize is that everything we think we know about how we describe the world is, may, is fundamentally based on an error in a very critical assumption, and that is that nothing exists in a state condition. Everything exists in a phase observation. And what we've done mathematically, what we've done in physics, what we've done in chemistry, is we've decided that we're going to impose state rules on phase conditions. And by changing our approach, to say everything is a phase condition that's always defined by an operational reality plus a context plus a set of energy sources. When we actually see that triad is always present, mm. then we realize that there is no such thing as a state condition ever. 
ever. There d it doesn't exist. And as a result, all of the static models that are serial static models of anything are fallacies. So I hear, I can hear a lot of potential in this uh, technique or technology that you've created, like even storing memories or yeah. like information. Yeah. So I'll give you an example. Um, one of the big problems in the drug industry yeah. is um, how to grow a liver. And the reason is because liver toxicity is one of the biggest critical tests in any time you do a pharmaceutical development. You have to figure out how much is a lethal dose where you can actually put too much of a chemistry in and it kills the cells and it knocks people out. So one of the big problems is how do you build a model of a liver because livers are the thing you need to test it on. But unfortunately, if you kill a liver, that liver is done. So hepatocyte differentiation is a very difficult biochemical process. And people tried all kinds of cultures and, you know, did all kinds of things to try to figure out how you could get hepatocytes to not only differentiate and grow, but keep them alive. And it turns out there was a company in my hometown of Charlottesville, Virginia, where I live now, um, that a company called Hemoshear, which actually figured out that maybe the physical deformation of blood flow through a liver is part of what signals a hepatocyte to differentiate. And so their theory was that the shear force of a fluid dynamic going across the cell actually is part of the differentiation effect. And they created, are you ready for this? The first fully sustainable hepatocyte differentiation environment where they could make livers. Literally in nothing. a lab. They could just take undifferentiated cells, make them hepatocytes, yeah. and turn them into livers. And now the cool thing is a biochemical engineer that came up with that idea, thus the name hemoshear, right? Blood flowing over a shear force. That's why they get the name. Okay. He, not surprisingly, was looking at the world through a mechanical lens, right? He said something about the shear force of the fluid dynamics going over the cell are important to establishing how the cell is going to differentiate. But he forgot to look at the fact that blood has charges, right? And we can think about heme or we can think about any of the iron bearing components of blood, but let's pull heme out for the sake of this conversation. When you have a moving particle that has a ferromagnetic property in it, and that property is moving across a fluid flow, what are you also creating? Because remember, every cell membrane has both static and dynamic potentials of electrical charges. So if I pass a ferromagnetic property across a set of potential charges, what am I also creating? I don't know. Well, I'm creating a field effect that's not just a simple charge experience, but I'm actually creating a field effect. So then the question is, yes, you could create a, a differentiated hepatocyte, but could you turn the hepatocyte into a liver? Because remember, life doesn't just make the cell, it makes the geometry. So how do you go from the cell to the functioning organ? Well, one would argue that it would be a pretty good idea if you wanted to have a liver to have it structured like a liver, right? I don't want a Petri dish that has hepatocytes. I want, I want a liver. I don't want just the thing that says, well, I've identified these cell types. That's a good step, but it's not the step that you need to actually turn it into the thing that is the mirror of the living system that you want to test. And it's not until you realize that Yes, the shear force does play a role. The pulse of the heart rate that moves that fluid across the cell, that does play a role. But what also plays a role is all the little charges and then all the little fields that are created, oh. which then build geometry. Mm. Well, nobody ever thought about that. Because mm. we just think that livers just grow into the shape they grow into. They don't. They take on the shape that they take on based on a series of interactions of field effects. And these are the kinds of thought processes that you need to start going through to go, oh, okay, how do we solve this problem? So, yes, the number of applications that we can have are far beyond anything you can count. You wouldn't have expected a guy talking about oil to talk about a liver. Yeah. But that's because you don't understand that inside of that story, there's an interesting metaphor, which is an ancient metaphor, which is the story of Prometheus. 
if you go back and look at the story of Prometheus, right, he goes up to Mount Olympus, he takes fire from the gods, he brings it down to people, and what's his penalty? His penalty is he's chained to a rock, and every day his liver gets eaten out. So somebody in the ancient world knew there was something that links hydrocarbons to livers. <laughs> That's crazy. This is a crazy yeah, but, but there it is. It's right in our own yeah. story. Yeah. It didn't say that the bird came down and ate out his kidneys. It didn't say it came down and ate out its bowels. It didn't say it ate out his eyes. It specifically said it ate out its liver. So the penalty for combustion was something about liver. So wouldn't it be a good idea if we have a whole myth narrative around that, to go back and look at those texts and figure out whether there's a metaphor buried inside of that story. Well, it turns out there is. And that's the kind of thinking, like, and that's the kind of thinking that I do all the time, which is there has to be truth embedded in everything. Because you can't, like, that story makes no sense. We don't know all of the elements of it because we're not there to speak to the first person who recorded the story or told the story, but we can actually go back to the story and say, oh, hold on a minute, there's something going on. Well, what is that? That is a mixture of light effects and macro effects of charges passing over variable fields, the introduction of energy, and the ability to make sure that when we do that, we understand that intrinsic in the combustion, the oxidation of hydrocarbons, there is a story that actually is decoded by a liver that gets rebuilt every day. You think back then they knew something? Well, so here's the question. If that is a story that was told thousands of years ago, like all the stories we tell, somebody somewhere had to know something because they didn't randomly choose a liver. Yeah. That's interesting. Right, and why would we, why would we bring those two, two worlds together? Yeah. That some, somehow a penalty, and the way we treat the story is the penalty for taking the fire from the gods is that you have to have your liver eaten out every morning. But think about the other side of that equation. You know what that means? Every day, Prometheus had the opportunity to have a brand new liver. Do you know how long you'd live if you actually had a giant brand new liver every single day? Well, That's one of the most old. important things to actually get to a proximity of immortality. So here's an interesting question. Was that a curse or was it a blessing? Now we sit there and go, well, I don't want a bird eating my liver while I'm chained to a rock, right? I don't want that. But if I knew that that was actually a healthy thing to do, would I spend 10 minutes letting a bird eat my liver if I knew that the next day I had a fully new functioning brand new liver? Well, that's a different proposition. If I could go through 10 minutes of discomfort to have perpetual youth in terms of how my body was able to process the environmental toxins, that's a pretty good deal. Right? I'd go through 10 minutes of anything yeah. if it gave me a clean start every single day. I could drink a lot. Yeah. Exactly. You could go out and have a party, right? <laughs> But you see the problem. The problem is we don't think about these things. So we, we don't think laterally. We think that, okay, is this a hydrocarbon conversation? Well, yeah, it is. But now we're talking about livers and we're talking about Prometheus and we're, yeah. right? But that's the problem. The problem is we don't think that way, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where education is totally messed up. That's you know, when do you hear about Prometheus. Well, you hear about that in a Greek mythology class. You don't hear that in a chemistry class. You don't hear that in a biology class. Mm -hmm. So nobody ever goes, oh, is that a biology story? Is it a chemistry story? What is it? We don't even think that way. But that's how we get trained not to solve problems. Because we don't have the tools to go, oh, these things belong together. Yeah, I th that sucks. Very often I talk with my dad about all of this. And he says, well, If they teach you that, then they should also teach you that. And also right. it can be, all of this can be connected, but right. just they don't do that because they're lazy and they just want, I don't know, they just want the money probably. Well, but they also want to produce people who are compliant. Yeah. Right. Okay. If you don't, if you don't know to ask these questions, it's much more easy to manage you. Mm. 
the minute you say, you know, like in this case, am I suggesting that a two and a half, three thousand year old Greek myth may be an indicator that somebody, I don't know, 5,000 years ago was doing what we're doing today? You know, the number of times that you hear people talk about archaeology and they say, how did they do it? Using the tools we have today. Okay, well, here's a tiny problem. What if they had better tools than the tools we have today? Right. We don't even consider that that might be a possibility, but that's because we're making that hubris-filled decision that says we're at the pinnacle of civilization, we're at the pinnacle of knowledge, we're at the pinnacle of all these things, Mm -hmm. rather than going, no, maybe we're the, right now, we're the Neanderthal. Yeah. Barely remembering the systems that were capable of carving stones and, you know, doing megalithic structures and... Mm -hmm. Maybe we're the maybe we're the ones that we can look at. And go, all we have is plywood yeah, studios. Actually, makes a lot of sense yeah. because I can see it in the schools. All these basically zombies. How they yeah. just they eat, sleep, go to school, learn, and then repeat all of this. It's yeah, boring and right. And they're never going to build a pyramid. Yeah, That's right. none of them. <laughs> they don't even. They think it's stupid. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. I see a lot of potential with, because we went a little bit off, um, I want to get back. So basically, this kind of technology, obviously, it will um, help reach the goals of Raza. Mm-hmm. Um, what else can it do? Because like the goals were, have another energy source that is reusable all Correct. the time. What else can we do with it? Well, so the great news is we can actually do a lot of cleanup. Um, there's a ton of places around the earth where environmental toxins, chemical toxins, things that are making places unusable, whether that is agriculture land that has been toxified with too much, you know, hydrocarbon based, you know, pesticides and herbicides and fertilizers and everything else. There's a lot of places where you can go into remediation where we clean up the messes that we made. But then we can also think about specialty materials, which is my favorite thing to think about, which is materials where we embed intelligence into things where we can actually have a very different experience of the way we encounter life, right? Can you imagine, for example, a polymer or a plastic or anything else that has very specialized conductive properties or data storage or power utility um, storage applications? You know, what if what if a plastic or polycarbonate car body, which is what most car bodies are made out of now, what if that was an antenna to attract a wirelessly transmitted power source? Now, do I need a battery? Do I need all the lithium that I have to go mine? Do I have to go after all of the rare earth metals? Do I have to do all that? No, I don't have to because I could actually turn the car itself into its own power antenna which doesn't need to be charged every 250 miles or every 400 kilometers and have the mess that we have right now of trying to adapt an infrastructure. Well, what if we don't have to adapt an infrastructure at all? What if we had the ability to have intelligent sensors and detectors where we added to our own experience, where we would have a greater awareness based on maybe the clothes we wear or any kind of interaction that we have with a technology that gave us a sense where we could pick up senses about you know, impending threats or proximity of people or whatever else. I mean, there's tons of things where you can think, would we be able to amplify the experience of a human being and the experience of the ecosystem so that we actually do a better job of being sensitive and caring and all those sorts of things? Imagine, you know, the the possibility of living in a world where you have the ability to amplify the neural inputs that you have to your brain where you're not trying to turn them into some sort of a priori model but you're amplifying your signal acuity so you have the ability to sense more you have the ability to integrate more you have the ability to analyze more those are all things that are actually not even remote possibilities there's things that we can do right now today where we can actually reactivate a whole bunch of the human cognitive potential and sensory potential that we don't even know we have lost. Those kinds of things have really huge applications because as we reactivate more of those things, we're going to increase our awareness. And so 
everybody is living in fear of AI right now. They say artificial yeah. intelligence thing is going to take the world out. Yeah. I see the entire platform of what we're building as augmented intelligence. And what's the difference between artificial and augmented? Augmented is saying you as the system are still going to be the system that has the preservation of all your faculties and all of the abilities that you have. But what we're going to do is use technology to increase your ability to increase the amplitude of your observation and the aperture of your observation. Now, what is that? That's augmented intelligence. That's saying you're already intelligent. You already have the capacities you have. What if I give you the ability to be increased in your capacity to use those things? Basically, cyborg. Or... Yeah. <clears throat> and so this concept is actually a very simple thing where I encourage people not to be afraid of it at all, right? Because as we increase our sensitivity, metaphorically, we will also do so literally and vice versa. The more we actually feel, the more we are aware of, the more we sense, the more we will actually have a better version of humanity. Yeah. Well, I've, that's funny because I've um, written a, a, I had to write a essay and uh, had to do my work about that in one school year. And I had to present it. It was in philo philosophy class. And I tried to explain that augmented intelligent intelligent sorry uh, intelligence is um necessary to coexist with this whole technology because yeah. if we just let the AI let loose they will do its own thing because they're right. they are already able to uh, program other ais right so how far is this going to go and i presented this and um i got a in Germany, it's five, it's, which is an F, I think, in in America, because she didn't like that. Yeah. And I used too much science in philosophy and, yeah, was just not... Well, but think about this. It used to, That used to be the standard, right? You, you used to have to bring yeah. philosophy into science. Yeah. Because there was this understanding that science not only had to be its own pursuit in a pure form, but it has to be pursued for the advancement of you know, a better humanity, a better experience or whatever else. And you can't have science in the absence of an ethic. At some point, there has to be a moral compass inside of the thing that we're doing. And so the fact that a teacher would find too much science in a philosophy paper is ludicrous because we have to actually understand that philosophy is a framed ontology that's parameterized by a series of assumptions. And what we describe as even what we teach in philosophy is a derivative of the science of acuity at the time that that philosophy was invented. Mm. So you would not have any philosophy but for science. Uh, this just shows again how that, um, about your point, that we are now maybe stupider than before. Exactly. Because literally they just, they don't combine subjects anymore, right. just as it, what you said before. Right. right. So, yeah, I think, yeah, I don't have any questions more. <laughs> well, it's a lovely conversation yeah, and I look was. forward to a lot more of them because I think one of the things that we have as an opportunity is to recognize that there are a number of people who are not dissimilar to you who know that the trajectory that we're on right now is a failed trajectory. We already know it. We don't have to guess. This idea that education is some sort of kind of cybernetic paradigm that we're going to come into this, you know, digital awareness of, of this bits and bytes approach to the world is crazy. I, I, I said, when Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking warned the world about the dangers of AI, I said, you have to look at the people who are doing the warning. If the world was created in the image of Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk, I wouldn't want to live in that world either. But that doesn't mean I fear the technology. I fear the architects of the technology failing to attach to their humanity. Because if you actually had humans fully engaged, fully sentient, fully aware, fully sensitive humans building technology, there would be not only nothing to fear, you'd actually have a good outcome.
And so I think that you represent, in many respects, a generation where the opportunity you represent is to say, against the backdrop of everything that people are saying, be afraid of, I think there's another narrative. And the other narrative is, no, not only don't be afraid of it, run headlong into it, but increase your human acuity, increase your human sensitivity, and then figure out how to augment that with the technology we have to actually overwhelm what is actually a very easy enemy. Because analog will always overwhelm digital, always, unless we give up. So this conversation for me is great optimism that at least one other person isn't giving up. And you can get all the Fs you want on, <laughs> on all the philosophy papers, but I'll always have the conversation about Prometheus and livers and yeah. hydrocarbons and we'll have a better life. Combine all these yeah. things. So this whole conversation, I had one sentence in my mind that was used in, a, um, in my favorite movie, Star Trek. Do you know it? Which one? Um, the last three ones I watched them. And it basically at the end, they always said, which I think might be a good ending to this conversation, uh, to boldly go where no man has gone before. Yeah, exactly. There and I go. think that is what we should do. Very good. So thank, thank you, very, you much. very much. Yeah, thank you. Great to talk to you. Yeah, to you too. Thank you.